it's been a wild kind of a week. <laughs> to be completely transparent, when I sat down to write this sermon finally on Thursday, I had no idea what it was going to be. <laughs> Monday, as I got back to school, or got back to church, there was a police officer waiting on me, and that's, that's not an everyday occurrence. <laughs> um, it was the Enid Public Schools police chief, and he was asking for volunteers to be a reunification site for parents and children in the event of a mass casualty event at Enid High School. Now, I couldn't say yes fast enough. We would absolutely do that. We can seat lots of people. And I was grateful to see Jana and Mickey later that day and had them echo absolutely just as fast as we can. So David, I'm sorry for you finding out this way. I haven't had a chance to talk to you yet. <laughs> but we, we were happy to do that. The heartbreaking thing was, he told me that we were the first church to say yes. That was quite heartbreaking. He, he protects 2,200 students and teachers and staff and we will do just as we gather school supplies just as we pray we will do everything we can to support them that was Monday Tuesday I drove to Oklahoma City to be present with the Giversons and Stephanie as she had surgery I ended up late because the surgery time was confused but that's okay I got to see her after she was done and that was a wonderful day thank you all for letting me be present Wednesday, I met another police officer for a very different reason. As I was racing to Oklahoma City to be present with John and Carol, <laughs> that, one I, that one shouldn't have been a surprise to me. I might have been going a little quickly. <sighs> I played the pastor card and he didn't give me a ticket. I didn't feel bad about that at all. But I got to be present with John and Carol and pray with them before John went to surgery and spent most of the day with them and still got to visit Stephanie briefly and be present with our brothers and sisters as they were undergoing medical treatment. Now, please understand, I'm not complaining. I'm just realizing as I was writing this sermon Thursday afternoon how far behind I was in my week. And... I realized that I didn't have a whole lot of time to spend with God this week. I usually get the kids off to school, get Sandy off to work, and then from 8 to 9, I generally spend praying, doing my Bible study, and singing, and singing poorly, just FYI choir, um, singing poorly. But this week, all of those things got discombobulated. So as I was driving to church on Thursday, I was listening to the radio, and I heard a song that spoke deeply to me and spoke about some of the stress that I had been under this week and spoke about some of the challenges we had faced, and I'll get to those in a minute. But it, taught, it reminded me of the sermon series I preached back in May. Having childlike faith in a world full of adult problems. We talked about trusting God no matter the circumstances. We talked about deepening our connection with God, growing our reliance on God, depending on God all the more. We talked about sin, not the church's favorite topic. We talked about how to focus, to focus on the needs of our brothers and sisters to focus on our need to be with God. We talked about not worrying about the way other people lived our lives and focusing on how we lived our life in response into God's call. And the last topic was probably the toughest. We talked about unity. 
unity in spite of our differences, in spite of our different theologies, in spite of the society we find ourselves in, in spite of our different politics. We as Christians, and specifically as disciples of Christ, are called to be united in all things. That's the very foundation of what our denomination teaches. Unity. Unity across all believers. That there is enough room under Christ for everyone. And as I was considering what I was going to preach today, God began to speak and lay on my heart that perhaps I needed one more moment to finish that sermon series appropriately. That maybe, just maybe, I had forgotten the most important part of all of those topics. I had forgotten that no matter the, the challenges we face, the health issues, the problems, the potholes in the road, maybe, just maybe, we need to remember that God's grace is infinite. That God's grace is new every single morning. And that God's presence and strength is all we need. That became a little clearer to me as I arrived at church and as I was working my way through my morning about 10.15 when this building got all crazy on me. About 10.15, the lights flickered really hard. And I sat up and the secretaries were like, hey, something weird's going on. Like, yeah, I got that. We began to look around and figure out what was going on. TJ's got a nosebleed. Um, there was no air conditioning or lights in this room. The chapel was in the same condition. The fellowship hall was in the same condition. And we had, we had uh, the YWCA's girl power class meeting in there. The chapel, or the loggia, was really weird. The lights were flickering on and off, and the, the only lights that were actually working were in the cases over there. There were no lights in about half the education wing, or a third of the education wing. And things got a little interesting. I was about half convinced we had been struck by lightning, and wasn't sure what that meant for us. Now fortunately, God was good. God's grace was amazing. OG&E arrived a few hours later, figured out that the fuse that hangs on the pole, those big ones that are about that long, one of ours had died, and they replaced it, and things quickly came back on, and no, we had not been struck by lightning, so all of that was good. But as we're sitting here almost in the dark, you begin to wonder and you begin to think of all the things you've got lined up and scheduled this weekend. We have church Sunday morning. We have hungry people, hungry, hungry brothers and sisters to feed on Sunday evening. We have shoes to get ready to give out on Sunday evening and shoes to give away on Monday. But I had faith that God would take care of us. That was also the day that Sandy's car died on the side of the road half a mile out of Cherokee. We managed to get a tow truck. We managed to get her back to home. And by the time the tow truck arrived, her serpentine belt was laying underneath her car. <laughs> it was an interesting day. Lamentations, a book I don't usually preach from very often, is a book filled with wisdom. One of my favorite writers says, Lamentation is a work of art produced in response to a historical disaster that you all have heard me talk about before. It is five poems that grieve the destruction of Jerusalem, the military occupation and deportation of the, of the leading citizens of Israel by King Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon in 586 BCE. The book of Hebrew, when or the book's name in Hebrew, when you translate it back into Hebrew, is eka, which translated is a preposition that means how. How? Now we can infer a more in-depth title, how on earth, God, could you allow this to happen to your people? Why, God, did this happen? 
This book is a lament, a cry out to God, why? Why did this happen? <coughs> now the structure of these poems is even more intriguing. I, I, I've told you all over and over again, I'm a biblical nerd of the first order. I love to study the language of the Bible. I can't think of any other reason I would have taken Hebrew and studied it and still played with it and still had my book on the corner of my desk that has the language in it so I can translate on my own. But this poem, these, each of these poems is designed in a way that's called an acrostic. It begins with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet beginning with Aleph and ending with Ta. And because they wrote them this way, literary studies tell us that it suggests a suffering that was complete and total and left no room for anything else. That's the reason they used the entire alphabet to encompass all of the suffering. Chapter 3 actually takes this a step further, devoting three full verses to each letter of the Hebrew al alphabet. One of, one of my other favorite writers says that Lamentations is a funeral lament for Jerusalem and the people of Israel. But he doesn't leave it there. He said, but that is not all. For each step across the acrostic of verses, we hear hope fading. We hear confidence in God failing. But as it's brought to conclusion, we see hope restored. We see confidence in God's trust in God rising. It is acknowledging the hurt, acknowledging the pain, acknowledging the struggle, but not surrendering to it. Not giving up. Not forgetting that God loves us. So as I read these scriptures from Lamentations 3, may God speak to you. May God bring you hope. May God bring you confidence. Because God's not done. But listen to these words. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercy never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is the faithfulness of God. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in God. The Lord is good to those who wait for God the soul who seeks God. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. For the Lord will not cast, off, cast us off forever, but through, though God may allow grief, God will have compassion according to the abundance of of God's steadfast love. For God does not afflict from God's heart or grieve the children of God. May the word of God, may the word of God bless you and keep you no matter the circumstances you are facing, no matter the hardship, no matter the, the obstacles you feel. May the God of grace and mercy provide them to you without measure today. As this book was written, the people of Israel, both those taken to Babylon and those left behind, were mourning. They were grieving the loss of their homes, the loss of their people, the loss of their nation. And yet there was hope. Verse 22 and 20, 24 says it clearly. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
The Lord is my portion, says my soul, and therefore I will hope in God. So even in this moment of deepest despair, even in this moment of deepest mourning, of loss, the writer and the people of Israel are singing God's praises, reminding each other that God is faithful. So just like the people of Israel before us, as we sit here today, in moments of despair, in moments of frustration, in moments of anger, in moments of loss, there is hope. God is not done. We know that there is a future in God, that there is a plan in God just as the people of Israel knew before us that this was coming. I preached on this topic recently. Do you remember? The prophet Jeremiah told them, told the people of Israel that this would come. That no matter what they did, no matter the defense they mounted, Babylon would crush Israel. This was not good news. On the heels of this pronouncement, that Jeremiah gave to the people of Israel from God. He gave them good news too. In spite of the fact that they were frustrated, probably angry and hurting, they still had the opportunity to praise God. Jeremiah 20, 11, 29, 11 says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and Jeremiah did as he was called. He delivered the bad news to the people of God and then proclaimed that God was not done, that God had a plan, that God would prosper Israel again. Just like today, there is a plan for the church, capital C. There is a plan for the people of God today. I'll echo the words of the prophet Jeremiah. Plans to prosper us, not to harm us, even though we don't understand. As I sat with the Sooner Sunday School class this morning, I said, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote Martin Luther. It's good for the church every 500 years to experience a little revelation and a little renewal and maybe even a little revolution as we are the people living through that 500 years I don't really think I'm going to thank Martin Luther <laughs> I'll thank him for the wisdom but it's challenging to live through these moments of change and upheaval it's challenging to live through these moments of grief frustration and mourning and it's hard not to do it with a little bit of anger and a little bit of frustration. But our hope remains that God has a plan. That God has answers even when we do not. And we must trust God and trust in God's plan and trust in God's amazing grace, love, and mercy that God will not abandon us. Now please understand, I'm not being flippant or cavalier about the problems, challenges, and struggles you are facing or the mourning and grieving you are experiencing, but God has a plan. Even when we don't understand it, even when we don't see it, even when it's all we can do to get up on the day, God is still pouring God's Spirit out in us each and every day. God's amazing grace is new every morning. We have not been abandoned. All we have to do, all God is asking us to do, calling us to do, is trust. Trust in that amazing grace that brought Jesus from heaven. 
trust in that amazing grace that raised Jesus from the grave. Trust in that amazing grace that is new every day. Even when all we want to do is cry out, How? Why, God? Why are you doing this to me? To us, to the church. Just like the writer of Lamentations before us, just like the people of Israel before us, God has a plan. Especially when we can't see it. Especially when all we have is our trust. God. We are not alone. We are not abandoned. I would share with you just a little bit of the words of the song I was listening to Thursday morning. It's by 10th Avenue North. It's called Warn, W-O-R-N, and it goes like this. I am tired. I am worn. My heart is heavy. From the work it takes just to keep breathing. I have made mistakes. I have let my hope fail. My soul feels crushed by the weight of this world. And I know you can give me rest. So I cry out with all that I have left. Let me see redemption win. Let me know the struggle ends that you can mend a heart that's frail and torn. I want to know a song can rise from the ashes of a broken life. And all that's dead inside can be reborn. Because I am worn. It's easy to become worn down. It's easy to echo this song as we journey through life. Because we get worn. We get worn out. We wander from God. But every single morning, God is calling us back. Every single moment of every day, God is calling us back into relationship with God, into God's grace, into the strength that God shares with us. So today, tomorrow, and this week, dive in. Let God renew your spirit. Let God renew your strength. in your mercy hear our prayers pour out your spirit in us that we may trust you more deeply that we may cling to you when we are hurting struggling tired and worn and let us rejoice in you because you are our salvation our hope Son Jesus, we pray.